So this, this section is going to be um, actually explain the differences between tanks, pumps, and valves. And so far, you've, you've drawn a tank, you've drawn some pipes, and you've drawn some nodes. So now we're going to add some more complexity to it. So again, we're going to cover, uh, the, during this discussion, tanks and reservoirs. And these are used to store water. Pumps, uh, they don't store. However, they add energy, or in the case of turbines, decrease energy. And then valves somehow control energy or flow. The primary differences between a tank and a reservoir is storage. A reservoir has an infinite volume of storage at a continuous head. However, you can adjust that head during an extended period simulation. And you can actually have that water surface elevation change. Um, a tank, however, has a finite volume, a fixed volume, and you are giving it a geometric configuration uh, shape. It's a cylinder. Uh, what's the diameter of the cylinder? What's the maximum water surface elevation? What's the minimum water surface elevation? And these are all elements that are needed to calculate how much drawdown there is in a tank during an extended period simulation. You're going to see on the first uh, few workshops that you dealt with the tank, the very first one yesterday and uh, today, the tank could be an in infinite diameter. And all that would really matter during a steady state model is the water surface elevation. It could be one foot diameter or infinitely large in diameter. And again, all that matters is the energy, potential energy, the head elevation in that tank when we're trying to look at pressure. When we start running extended period simulation, then storage is really critical. And that lets us know how quickly uh, the tank is drawing and filling. So again, steady state, it's just a snapshot. It's just a calculation based on boundary conditions. And a boundary condition is tank water level, not tank diameter in that case, because it's a snapshot in time, just tank water level. Okay, And again, a little bit of detail on tanks here. Whenever you set up a tank the first time, you will, will need the uh, initial elevation. Uh, it could be zero, but uh, uh, that would only work if your minim minimum elevation was zero. Uh, but basically, you'll need to populate the initial elevation, the minimum elevation, and the maximum elevation. Uh, so you'll enter those, and as well as the base. And, and if you're, uh, the reason that that's important is that's, I've got a screen to show you how graphically that works out. But are your elevations set by the base, or your elevations uh, in the tank water, uh, are they actually set by your actual mean fee elevation levels for every one of them? So uh, effectively, what is your data? And, and then also, while we're on this slide, when we get into water quality, uh, you can actually enter in the initial age in, in a tank, the initial concentration. Perhaps it's chlorine concentration in a tank or something. And the initial conditions during a water quality model really matter uh, during a water age analysis. The initial conditions on tank really matter because the water in a tank right now, wherever you're at, if there's a tank out your window or something, the water in that tank has a particular age already. It didn't start from zero. It's something. It's two weeks old. It's one week old. It's, it's something. Or it's got some chlorine level in it. So you would set that here. Now, again, we're just, for the first uh, few days, we're only running a steady state model. We're not running extended period simulation nor water quality. Uh, so I'm just introducing these to you, that these are actually held in the property of a tank. Okay, And then back to the reservoirs, you can assign the pattern, uh, which will adjust the HGL um, by hour, by day, or by month for uh, that. Perhaps it's a clear well. Perhaps it's groundwater. Uh, perhaps it's a lake. Uh, reservoir, um, and you're just simulating the change in the elevation. Okay, so uh, the impacts of tanks and reservoirs. Uh, tanks provide emergency storage, and they help equalize pressures during your peak day, your maximum day, and they balance the water out. Uh, we'll have some graphs that we get into talking about tank operations and, and how they fluctuate and how to evaluate that. So we're going to get into more detail as the course progresses and take another look at tanks again. Uh, however, tanks do potentially cause some water quality issues because of perhaps a wide tank may not be mixing well. A large or oversized tank for the future may have long residence times. And chlorine may drop. Uh, the tank water level gets really warm. It may drop. Uh, whatever the situation is, just there's potentially some negative impacts due to oversized tanks. Pumps, on the other hand, remember they add energy. So we'll be adding pumps in this next workshop that comes up. 
uh, we've got uh, a pump curve uh, that we'll be working with. Uh, every time we touch a pump, we're going to create a pump de definition, and that is a pump curve. And that lets us know at what particular pressure the pump is pumping against, uh, uh, what flow will it deliver. So let's look at a few graphs here. Uh, the first graph here uh, would resemble, perhaps, a pump curve. Uh, the pump would start out at a peak flow, or at the highest flow here. And as the system pressure, so this is H, H over here in the uh, axis, as system pressure decreases, the pump is able to deliver more flow. And as the system pressure is at its lowest point that the pump is pumping into, the pump is delivering a larger amount of flow. So flow is increasing on this axis, head is increasing on this axis for a pump curve. This next curve is an efficiency bell. And if the design point for a pump is operating at this point, then one would say that the pump is operating at its highest efficiency point. And that efficiency point would be right here at the, at the peak of this bell curve. Uh, if your pump was operating here at this point, one would say that the pump is not operating as efficiently because it would map to a particular efficiency value here. And then we have a few more, more curves to look at. Uh, we've got a horsepower curve and an NPSH curve uh, and a system curve. So there's uh, some other curves to consider. Uh, the system curve, um, as you increase the flow through a pipeline, uh, in increase Q, the head loss will increase. And where, uh, where those lines intersect, uh, where those lines actually intersect the pump curve, that ends up being the operating point. Uh, so uh, if it's multiple horse mains pumping into it, uh, themselves, the system curve is going to be more steep. If it's a really large diameter pipe, the system curve is going to be very shallow. And the pump is then, therefore, going to be able to deliver a larger amount of flow. So we're going to see this, see system curves and pump curves quite a bit, um, but this is just, again, an introduction to it. Defining the pump curve itself in WaterCAD and Water Gems, you usually only are going to use three points. Uh, but you know, if you want to use quite a few more points, great. Uh, um, the three that you would need, then, to, to accomplish this is the shutoff head, which is the point at which the pump will shut off if the pressure increases to a certain high point. Most efficient point, which was that bell-shaped curve, um, hopefully that's where your pump is operating at the most efficient point. And then the maximum flow. Uh, the maximum flow is the runout point for a pump. Uh, the maximum flow does not necessarily mean where it, where it bombs on the axis right here, because a lot of times the pumps aren't even going to deliver a flow way out to the end of the axis where head is you know one foot or one meter. Uh, the pumps are going to trip off or shut off somewhere. Uh, before that point, so maximum flow isn't always going to be uh, isn't going to be out here. It's just the pumps aren't going to run that far out. So you need to refer to the pump manufacturer catalog to see what that actual maximum flow is going to be. When we change the speed of a pump or we change the size of the pump uh, impeller, what we're effectively doing is taking the same pump curve and we're shifting it on the axis and moving it out. And that's effectively what a VFD is doing, is it's moving the pump curve up or down. And, and I've got some slides, some additional slides to show you what that actually means, because then you have new efficiency bell curves, too, for each of those new pump curves at a new speed. So we'll get in more detail on that when we get into extended period simulations, too. So where do you get these pump manufacturer cat or, or pump curves? You might go to a manufacturer catalog. Um, if it's a pump that's been around for a while, you may actually uh, need to look at doing some pump performance tests to size the pump. Uh, or not, I'm sorry, not size the pump, but determine if the pump curves are actually producing the flows that you believe they're producing. And this is an example of calibration where, let's say, let's exasperate a little bit. You have a 20-year-old pump. You put in a pump definition curve from the day it was manufactured and put into operation. Now, 20 years later, it's more than likely not operating at that point on the pump curve anymore. So coming back in and, and using the true pump curve through pump testing would be calibrating your model. It's either that or maybe it's time to replace the pump. But, uh, but, but uh, calibrating your model to use the actual pump curve would be um, 
heading towards using your model to predict the real world more accurately. You can model a uh, pump as a constant discharge head node. And if you were going to do this, this is more or less, um, it's saying no matter what, the head is always going to be a certain amount. And no matter what, uh, we'll continue to deliver flow at, at that rate. Why you would want to use a pump curve like this is perhaps planning. Uh, you don't know how many pumps you're going to have at the pump station, but you know you're going to deliver 2,500 gallons a minute no matter what, even if you have to add more pumps to make that happen. Uh, so it's preliminary design phase, whereas uh, you could actually use pump definition curves, uh, plotting them out and everything to show the true performance of that pump. But if you haven't even selected them yet and you know you're going to do that sometime down the road, you can use a constant discharge head node. Okay, a little bit of information now about variable speed drives. Um, what is a variable speed pump? Uh, VFD, VSD, variable speed drive, there's a couple acronyms for them as well. Um, think of a cordless drill. Uh, the more you squeeze the trigger on a cordless drill, the faster the pump or that drill will spin. And that's effectively what's happening with the variable speed drive. It's more energy is being delivered and the pump is spinning faster. And how this is happening is there's a lot more electrical controls that are uh, variable speed motor uh, that's on connected to that pump. Now, they're generally more efficient um, because they're able to deliver exactly the flow and pressure that's needed. However, there's an immediate um, uh, reduction in efficiency because of the electrical input that is having to be reshaped. And there's an energy loss there. There's something like a 20% a energy loss right off the bat to convert the electrical signals to where you can have a variable speed drive. And there's, cab and there's an electrical cabinet, and there's probably some HVAC cooling that needs to go on. So when you're, when you're modeling these, uh, take into account the full kind of full perspective of uh, variable speed drives and all of their costs that might be associated with it. Variable speed pumps work really well on dead-end systems where a constant speed pump is just going to become really inefficient. And we'll see some examples of that on a workshop, a really neat, neat uh, case study that we'll work through. So again, for variable speed drives, consider the total life cycle costs of all of the expenses, that electrical increase, uh, HVAC increase, whatever else is going on when you're looking at specking out or using a variable speed drive over a constant speed pump. Uh, we'll be able to look at pump curves and uh, at various time steps. A uh, couple things that we'll see. Um, we can look at uh, and put in. These are actually points that we will enter into the model uh, with the pump definition for the uh, pump efficiencies at various times. Uh, and then if we're looking at a variable speed pump, we can have multiple pump curves. So I'll show you here. Here's one pump curve at one speed. Here's another pump curve at another speed. Here's another pump curve at another speed. So all of those pump curve lines are representative of different speeds at which that pump is running. And then there's a new relative efficiency bell for each new or each uh, pump speed. So we would need to add in those efficiency bells. Uh, this really only comes into play when we're running a model over time and allowing the model to pick a range of speeds uh, for a pump. So in steady state, we're not going to really see this come into play, but we will whenever we start seeing efficiencies uh, and running the model over time. Okay, uh, very quickly, uh, system head curves. Uh, as we increase the velocity in a single pipeline, think of just a single pipeline here we're pumping out to a discharge tank. As we increase the velocity in that line, the head loss is going to increase. It's going to go up, right? Decrease the velocity, the head loss is going to go down. There's a static lift that we automatically have to apply to that pump, uh, meaning we have to lift it from suction tank level up to the discharge tank level. That's at the very least, that is our lift, our hydraulic lift that we need to apply plus the static head. So we would add these two together to figure out what our uh, energy, uh, our pump needs to deliver and what that pump curve needs to look like to be able to match the, match appropriately the system curve. But in a real system, it's not just one pipe. It's lots of pipes going on at one time. And what WaterCan Water Gems does is it boils down 
uh, that one uh, system curve or, or the many system curves down to one. That way, that pump is really only seeing one system curve downstream. But again, just uh, just to reiterate, the pump curve, the head discharge curve, is the performance of the pump characteristics. The system curve is the performance of the system itself. If it's a single pipeline or it's the entire distribution system it's pumping into, that intersection point is the pump operating point. That's the desirable point where we want the efficiency to be at its highest. And we can use WaterCAD and water gems to help us determine what the design flow should be. If the pumps are turning off or if they're not able to deliver that flow, we can go back in and adjust the size of the pumps in the model. And then we can go go find in the pump catalog a pump that's going to deliver that flow, put in that pump curve, and then check to make sure that the model is be able to deliver the design flow uh, if it's operating at the proper efficiency point. Uh, maybe check and make sure that when two pumps are on, we're not, we're not uh, becoming very inefficient because one pump is competing with the other. And then look at energy life cycle costs. So a lot of these steps we can do in the model, uh, but you have to start from somewhere right? and uh, start with some pump curve to get the model going and then check and make sure that that pump curve is correct. And along the way, you might do a first run and, and determine that this is what the system curve looks like. And based on that system curve, you go to pump manufacturer catalog. And there's a pump series. It's usually some shape or something that's in the pump catalog that says this series, five pumps, they're all represented here. So go to this page in the pump manufacturer catalog. So you go there, look up everything, and you find, oh, OK, here's, here's uh, three or four pumps that I might want to try. So then you go to your model and put in those pump definition curves, those pump curves. OK, now moving on uh, from pumps themselves to pump stations. Uh, back in select series five or six for VAI, we added pump station elements. And of course, that's available in the Connect version as well, uh, to where you can draw a polygon around the pump station. And anything inside of that polygon, you can associate to that polygon uh, so that such that all of those pumps are within that area. Um, you can analyze different pump combinations. Uh, you look at, can look at energy costing at the pump level. and modify your controls as well for a pump station. So th having the pump station is kind of nice because it gives you a, a more a more coarse way to look at the uh, uh, pumps themselves. So you can look at it from the perspective of the pump station. Let's see. I'm going to introduce one other tool. And this is one that we would cover be covering typically in the advanced course called Darwin Scheduler. And Darwin Scheduler is a tool that allows you to optimize your start and stop times when you have many pumps in a system. And a lot of times, there are energy hogs that um, you know a pump is burning a whole lot of energy out in the system. And to be honest, the, these energy hogs, these pumps that are consuming all this energy and are highly inefficient, they don't jump up and raise their hand and say, here I am, here I am. Uh, you have to kind of find them. And provided that you have the right pump curves in, in the model, you can use Darwin Scheduler to go in and based on the pump curves and efficiencies and uh, cost of energy per day, help figure out um, which pumps need to go on when and optimize your entire system. And it basically goes through thousands and thousands and thousands of different iterations of, of different ways one pump could be on or another pump could be on and which one starts saving you the most money. And it starts honing in on some of the top solutions that would give you the most efficient or lowest energy cost for your system. So it's, a, it's an advanced tool, uh, very beneficial if you have a system with lots of pumps and you're trying to recommend ways to save energy or propose ways to save energy. All right, now moving on to valves and other things. So there's quite a few different valves that we can play with and model with WaterCAD and water gems. Uh, one of the most common ones is an isolating valve. And I'll show you what that element looks like. Air release valves or a control valve uh, that we could have that would be releasing air. Throttle control valve. Um, and then there's we're going to have different kind of control valves to uh, change the pressure and flow. A check valve. Flow emitters. Altitude valves. I'll, I will say altitude valves exist in the real world, so don't forget about them. However, water can water gems does turn off a tank once the pressure in the line feeding the tank exceeds the maximum water surface elevation in that tank. So in effect, you'll see a tank turn off, but that's because there's a built-in altitude valve. That doesn't mean out in the real world 
you don't need one. You'll still need an altitude valve. So I uh, just want to throw that rem reminder in there, too. Uh, backflow preventers. All of these valves I'm talking about, we can model them. And I can walk you th through how to model each of them. This is just a, a brief summary of, of the valves that are available. Uh, we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about PRVs, pressure reducing valves, and PSVs, pressure sustaining valves. PRVs can be in an active state where they are controlling the pressure, pressure reducing. They're, they're reducing something. They can be in an inactive uh, state where they're completely open and there's no flow or no, no uh, energy loss, no pressure reduction. Or they can be in a closed state. They could either be closed because of the setting or, they, or they're closed because you closed them. Uh, because you as the modeler said, I want this valve to be closed. And whenever you're looking at valves and water can water gems and you're trying to figure out which way the valve is going, uh, for a pressure reducing valve, there's a dark side of the arrow and a control loop that's looking downstream. So that control loop leg is looking downstream and reducing the pressure downstream. If it was a valve controlling upstream, that loop would be pointing upstream. But the black arrow is to simulate uh, the direction of flow. So just if you're trying to interpolate which direction your valve is, that's a quick way to know. How a pressure reducing valve works in water can water gems, you would provide a setting for that PRV, which you're going to do in the workshop. You'll, you'll uh, enter the setting for it. And in this case, 70 PSI is coming in. We have a setting at 55 PSI, so there's plenty of energy. It's burning up some energy. And we're able to meet and satisfy 300 gallons a minute downstream without a problem. Check. That one works, because there's plenty of energy coming in. Water can water gems would actually be double checking to make sure that's happening. But for argument's sake, we'll say that works. In the second case, we have a PRV. 70 PSI is coming in. And we have valve setting at 55 PSI. However, the downstream side, uh, we've got 65 PSI, which that effectively means that the PRV would close. How, in a model, could we get a higher pressure downstream than the setting on the PRV? Because this was, would be an example of how a PRV would close on its own. What could cause 65 PSI downstream? If it's due to elevation, then we've already put in our PRVs incorrectly. Uh, we shouldn't have even put those in in the first place then. Perhaps it's coming from a pump or some connection to assist the system from somewhere else that's creating that higher pressure and generating higher energy in the system. And then the third condition for a pressure reducing valve, 40 PSI is coming in. Again, our setting is 55 PSI, so that means the valve is completely open. It does not need to reduce any pressure because it's less than the pressure setting to begin with. So it's delivering all out. It's trying to deliver that 300 gallons a minute. And it's not controlling at that point. Pressure sustaining valves, on the other hand, if you'll notice, the control loop is looking upstream. It's sustaining a pressure upstream. So we want that pressure to be 55 PSI upstream. It's currently 55 PSI upstream. And there's a little bit of energy loss that we're going to experience going through the valve. Uh, so we're only able to deliver, say, 250 gallons a minute because it's controlling. If we have 70 PSI coming in, there's plenty of energy uh, to sustain that 55 PSI upstream. So we burn a little bit of energy, but we still have plenty to satisfy that demand. And then if we had a situation where uh, place where you might actually use a pressure sustaining valve is one utility is providing water to another smaller utility. And that primary utility is trying to maintain a certain system pressure. And if the pressure uh, drops, they no longer want to deliver flow to the other utility that they're connected to. So that's the case where you might have a pressure sustaining valve, is to maintain pressure in a system uh, such that it doesn't drop below a certain point. Uh, so that pressure, pressure sustaining valve, in this case, uh, 45 in the main system, 55 is the setting, so the valve is going to then close because it cannot maintain 55 PSI because there's already something less than 55 PSI. So no demand can be met downstream as a result. Okay, And another type of valve I'll share with you is a reduced pressure backflow valve. You might see these. Uh, say at a wastewater treatment plant washdown area or something like that. Uh, and there's a couple different ways that you can model these. 
And the one that I'll say is probably the more easy, easier one to approach would be to use a check on a pipe. Uh, and you can right click and say has check for a pipe. And that adds a check valve symbol. And then you add a general purpose valve in line. And that general purpose valve, you can put some additional uh, minor losses on that valve. And that will help you accommodate for the, gen generally these type of valves have more substantial head losses. Another way, way to do it is to use an actual check valve itself and a pressure breaker valve. Uh, that way you're maintaining the behavior of that reduced pressure backflow valve. Because no matter what, in these cases, the water flow is not going to be modeled going backwards because of that check valve. You can model air valves as well as a different type of valve. And that was added in one of the last, I think, again, select series, uh, one of the last select series versions. And it's, of course, in the Connect Edition. And how an air release valve will work. Um, generally, if there's air in a line, it would um, you would need to get the air out of the line, and you can size the orifice. Uh, you can put the size of the orifice, and that will uh, let the model be able to determine how quickly the air will escape from the line, and then it will turn into full pipe flow at that point. Uh, so in this case, um, we have an air release air release valve that is actually uh, filling, and then it's closed. And once it's closed, uh, we can now uh, we can now pump uh, over the top of that hill. So if you have air release valves, you can actually model those. Uh, but you do need a little bit more information. And you would probably get that from the air release valve manufacturer catalog on how the, the size of the orifice and, and how that valve actually operates, if it's a combination air release valve or not. And, uh, and I'll add, with, uh, with previous versions of WaterCAD, uh, we assume, like most other models out there, that a siphon occurs at the high point, which that may only be the case um, rarely, uh, but not often. But now you can actually truly model their release valve. And you can connect, correct the flows and heads and location where flow transitions from full pipe flow in a pressure pipe. And then last but not least, our friend, the general purpose valve. If you need a valve for any other purpose and you need to provide a flow versus head loss curve, you would apply a general purpose valve in the model. And a few more details on valves. Uh, you can have a relative percent closure percentage, uh, basically a valve characteristic or pattern. And based on that relative closure, you can have a relative discharge coefficient. So effectively, how much percentage of the flow is moving flow through the valve at what percentage closure. Uh, some valves, think of a butterfly valve, they have a more linear um, closure to discharge coefficient. Uh, because they've got, uh, a butterfly valve has more surface area that the water profile will see and it will slow down. Uh, compared to, say, a knife valve, a knife gate valve or a gate valve, uh, those valves could be at 80% closure and still pretty, pretty darn close to 100% flow. And it's for that reason that those types of valves are really prone to having um, bad water hammer because someone might think that the last 20% it's at, it's at, uh, 80% valve closure when it's still 100% flow. And those last few turns are turned rather quickly, and you go more rapidly from 100% flow to zero in the last few turns of the valve. So you can, you can simulate the discharge of the valve based on valve closure if you need to. And then uh, you can put in patterns of valves. A lot of times downstream from a pump station or a treatment plant, there may be valves that open and close to allow the pumps to start pumping against a partially closed valve, and then it begins to open. So you can have relative percent closure based on time and apply a pattern to a valve as well. So lots of different things that you can do if that's really what's happening out in the real world or if you're trying to design something in the future. Okay, And then water meters. Um, generally, you don't, we don't model head loss through a water meter because that's the handoff point. Uh, it's generally the responsibility of the entity to typically maintain a reasonable pressure at the flow meter, but not through the flow meter. But if you wanted to, uh, there would be a particular k value based on the type of flow meter that you're using. And, and again, that's going to be subject to whatever is in their um, water meter uh, manufacturer catalog. And then flow totalizers, um, or uh, basically anything that passes flow through it in water can and water gems can become a flow totalizer. 
and keep up with the total amount of flow that went through from one time to another. And then flow emitters, we're going to discuss this more when we cover uh, during the fire flow, represent, fire flow uh, presentation. Uh, but this is how we uh, let water um, be emitted out of the system. Um, perhaps it could be a sprinkler or irrigation system. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to discuss flow emitters later on. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.